Welcome in to another episode of The Big Hit. I am your host, Tim Quigley. We've got another great and exciting show on the way. We take a look at the Derek Jeterless Yankees and the rest of the entire MLB playoffs. Also take a look at some college football, preview a couple key games there. Also, our analysts take a dive into the college basketball, give you, give you a little preview there. And we conclude the show with a plethora of topics in a segment I love to call Rapid Fire. But right now, we're going to open things up on the far left. You're Freddie Mitchell in the middle of Dimitri George. We call this segment the first cut. First cut. And guys, just like you said, first cut, first uh, segment of the show. Let's dive right on in. Got some NFL up for you. Steelers, quite frankly, lose a heartbreaker out in Tennessee by a last second field goal of what, quite frankly, shouldn't have been. Freddie, I'm going to start down with you. Uh, at this point of the season, what's more of the problem for the Steelers? Is it going to be the offense and the lack thereof of the running game or the defense where there seems to be a lot of injuries? Uh, statistically, I think it's you, you look at it and the defense looks pretty good, and they are doing pretty good. But they got they got to get pressure. You can't I mean you can't blame 100, percent but they need to get pressure. I mean Troy Palmu has been on. He only played a couple series in one game. James Harrison hasn't played that much either. But they really have to get they get the pressure up. They only need to keep doing what they're doing right now. Just need to keep doing what they're doing. I mean, nothing's the blame. I mean, yeah, all right, there is problems in the offense, but I think I really think it's more on the defense right now. They're not getting pressure at all. They only have 11 sacks this season. That's not Steeler defense. Definitely not Steeler defense. Dimitri, you got anything to add on to that? I've got, to, I've got to agree with him, Tim. I, you know, if this isn't your grandfather Steelers, you know, when you think of the Steelers, you think defense, run the ball, the steel curtain. Uh, but like I said, they're not getting pressure on the quarterback. Uh, their, their secondary is vulnerable when they don't get pressure. Ike Taylor's having a pretty bad, uh, pretty bad. First couple of, uh, game series, been targeted a lot. He is getting called a lot of, for a lot of penalties. Um, I know they've been decimated by injuries this year, this uh, this week. They're uh, Lamar Woodley's coming back, um, and hopefully they'll play James Harris and Lamar Woodley get to play a game together with each other because you know, when, when they're together, they tend to produce a, a good number of sacks. So you know, like like like, like I said, uh, the defense needs to step it up definitely. The offense is carrying them uh, so far. If it wasn't with them, they they might be winless. Might be winless. That's strong coming out of any kind of Steeler fans and definitely not something Steeler Nation doesn't want to hear. I personally think age is starting to hit him. Paul Amalo's had his share of injuries. Harrison's not getting any younger. Lamar Woodley, like Dimitri, you said, finally coming back. And with all these injury guys, and what are they at now? They're at 500? On They're the, two and three. They're two, two and three, three, so they've got a losing record. Not a lot of success coming out of the uh, AFC there or the entire – that whole other, conference. yeah, the entire conference or the entire division per se. Only two teams, I believe, have a winning record. So I'm going to ask you two guys: Do the Steelers are they still considered a playoff team? Most definitely, they're definitely considered a playoff team. If they get healthy and the offense keeps doing what they're doing, the AFC East is wide open right now. We have the, they didn't play a division game yet, so if they can start winning their division games, I think they'll be all right. They're going to they'll make the playoffs if they can win those division games. Absolutely, yeah, I, I agree. I can't agree with you more. Um, once they get healthy and they get their player, the, the defense going, turn around. Um, like I said, the offense is possessing the ball uh, for I would think over 35 minutes a game. Uh, so you know the defense is on the field that long. They just gotta you know get dialed up and get some more pressure on the quarterback. Because like I said, if they don't get pressure on the quarterback, that secondary is vulnerable and they're gonna give up a lot of big plays. They have to get it turned around. But like I said. That's very mediocre in the AFC. There's only two teams with running records. They've got it. They they have a chance to turn it around. Yeah, and the only two teams I believe that are it are actually have a winning record. I believe one's the Texans and Baltimore. And Baltimore. So, a, wa a wide open league per se. Absolutely. Let's move things along here. Go to the other side of the state, city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, and it's a theme with Pennsylvania teams this week losing by a field goal 
in overtime against the Detroit Lions. At one point, Eagles were up 10 going into the third quarter. So over the fourth and overtime, they managed to blow the game. I want to ask you guys, did the Lions deserve the win or did the Eagles give it away and choke? Uh, personally, I think the Eagles choked. This is the, this is the Eagles last two years. Uh, they blew seven fourth quarter leads in the last two seasons. That's the most in the NFL. And the Steelers are doing good until the fourth quarter. They started bringing a blitz, and then Calvin Johnson started getting one-on-one -on -one coverage, and he started catching the ball, and the Lions started driving. I think they just blew the game. Philadelphia chokes in the fourth quarter when it comes down to it and when it matters. That's harsh words, choking in the fourth quarter. Dimitri, you got anything to – any positive things? Or are you still going to – is it all the defense fault? Uh, I hate to do this to you, Tim, but I, I, I truly feel like it's a little bit of both. I think uh, the Eagles let up a 10-point lead. Uh, I think it was double-digit lead in the fourth quarter. Um, it, it was a really sloppy game all, all around, but they, had, they were able to get a lead in the, in the fourth quarter. They just couldn't sustain it. The Lions, like, like Freddie mentioned, they started driving. Calvin Johnson started to make some plays, and it's, it's, you know, it resulted now into Juan Castillo losing his job. Yeah. So you know, it, clearly there, there are some issues going on in Philadelphia, um, so they need to, definitely need to get their things turned around. And it was hard for Andy Reid, too, firing what he later said in a press conference, one of his best friends in the entire yeah. game. And now that has led some people to believe he's gone off the Vic and say, hey, you're next if things continue to go wrong. I think they're both next. So they both could be. Yeah, they very well could be. But, again, let's, let's keep it on the east side of the state, take a trip down the interstate, go to the Ravens here. Ravens barely pull out the win against the Cowboys. And I want to ask you guys, who's more to blame for the Cowboys? Could it be Tony Romo, who really hasn't had a good game this year? Or could it be Dez Bryant dropping that? two-point conversion that would ultimately cost them that game. I think for, I think it's about a little bit of everyone. I think you have to blame Tony Romo throwing interceptions. Des Bryant isn't catching all the passes that's thrown to him. But in reality, the Cowboys are hurting themselves. They have 46 penalties for 330 yards throughout the season. They're shooting themselves in the foot every time. They had 13 penalties on Sunday against Baltimore. I mean... I don't, I don't know what like they could do. Like they have to get their like they have to get themselves together. They're hurting themselves more than anything. It's, it's a little bit of everyone. Clock management at the end of the game. Uh, I, I, I can't play, play, place any blame on anybody specifically. Um, I feel like they outplayed the Ravens um, for the entire football game. They ran over for over 220 yards against the Baltimore Ravens, the vaunted Baltimore Ravens defense with Ray Lewis and company. Um, they, they were able to establish the run. They were able to, I thought Tony Romo played, uh, played better than Joe Flacco, who had a pedestrian day. I think it was 17 to 26 for over 20 yards and a touchdown. Um, but if I had to pick one, I'd probably say the coaching staff and Jason Garrett for that clock management at the end of the game. Um, you just get a big pass interference penalty. Uh, you got, I mean, you're able to get 26 seconds with one timeout, and you're able to you're able to get a good amount of, get closer to the field goal than 51 yards. So if I had to place one blame, I'd definitely say Jason Garrett with clock man management at the end of the game. Yeah, and you could also throw the clock management blame on Tony Romo, guy, the quarterback, the field general, the entire team. 26 seconds left, you have a timeout and you don't use it, and you just let the clock run down to five seconds left. Yeah, that's, that's, that's poor. That's that, that, poor. I mean, with, with that kind of time left, you can at least throw a couple right. out yeah, routes, absolutely. get out of bounds. Absolutely. And, yeah, it's a lot of things you could have done and could have changed. But I'm going to flash back to what Dimitri said here. Ray Lewis and um, the other player, Ladarius Webb, yep. both originally at the time, I thought they were potential season ending. News came out yesterday. Both are done for the year. How does this affect the defense, guys? How does, does this change the entire landscape of the AFC I th division? I personally think I think the Ravens are their season's probably probably done. You have uh, Terrell Suggs; he's out as well right now. I don't think they really have a chance to do anything without having a defense. That offense they have with Joe Flacco isn't going to put up the numbers they need—35 to 42 points a game to win them games throughout the season. I don't. I don't. I don't have no. Their window for the playoffs is very small. I disagree. I, I think they're going to be fine. Um, like, I, like we alluded to earlier, the AFC is barely mediocre. Uh, they're already 5-1. Um, I, I, I think they're undefeated in the division so far. Um, but I think the bigger, they're not going to be able to replace the leadership, the veteran leadership, the presence of Ray Lewis in the middle of that defense. Um, Ladarius Webb just signed a big extension in the offseason. Uh, he's a top flight corner. Uh, they, 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 it's just it's heartbreaking to see Ray Lewis because you know, it might be his last game of his career, and we, won't, we don't want to see that. But like I said, I don't think they're completely done. I think they'll make the playoffs, uh, but definitely big losses. And but they gotta overcome adversity. Yeah, I don't. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think it's gonna affect the team as a whole, but definitely losing that leadership on the defense. That's, that's that a lot of leadership right that's, there. That's 
15 years of leadership and absolutely he, he, he basically the face of that Baltimore defense absolutely, absolutely. Definitely. a big loss there and it's gonna be a big loss because I got to send you guys back up to the booth this segment's <laughs> over and again that does it for this segment up next I'm gonna dive into some MLB playoffs stay tuned today I'm going to talk about Patty Patty's best characteristics, she's stupid, stupid and ugly. Everything she does is ugly, watch her eat, watch her stuff her face. Look at her, greasy hair, dirty fingernails, it makes me want to vomit. Get a life, Patty. Thank you. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite part, my favorite, what did you ask? I have never dated a man in the Navy. I'm gonna burp. I am Ray Cardoza, IUP TV. Not like other stations, I don't know. <laughs> IUP TV. Like no other station. No, you're wrong. Oh, you screwed it? it up. I'm sorry, what is it? What is it? Not your average Not station. Not your average station. Not like, other stations. Not like other stations, okay? And welcome back to the Big Hit, the only sports talk show that really matters here on IEP TV. And as promised before the break, I'm going to dive into some MLB playoffs. Quite frankly, my favorite time of the year, right beside the offseason with free agent signings and managerial positions. We'll get into that a little later. On the far end, Brent Werfel. In the middle, Mark McKetta. Guys, again, let's just get right on into this. We've got a lot to cover. Brent, going to start down with you. I hate to throw this topic your way. <laughs> Yankees are down 2-0, man. They lose Derek Jeter, breaks his ankle, out for the rest of the postseason. Do you think the Yankees can come back? And how does Derek Jeter being down like this hurt them the rest of the way throughout the playoffs? Tim, not only do I think that the Yankees can come back, I think they will come back. This, this game, three tonight, Tuesday night, will be against Justin Verlander, who is a very tough competitor. But I think if, we get, if the Yankees get to them early, and get the bats working. They haven't been hot at all for a long time. I think tonight they realize the importance of this game. I think that they have to bring it. With DJ being out, that's huge because he's the captain. He's the, pretty much the soul of this team. With him, with him not being able to get to his two hits a game like he always does in October and in this, this late in the season, in the postseason, it's really going to hurt them because he's really what makes that team go. He, he's the captain. DJ, him being out, it's, it's going to be a test for the Yankees if they can make this. But I think they have enough, de enough depth, and the bats are going to start working here soon. Yeah, maybe the bats start working. Derek Jeter, I mean, not Derek Jeter, Alex Rodriguez, I think last time I checked, was 0 for 16 with 12 strikeouts. Need him to step up. And the only guy that's really, actually only two people that have stepped up. Recent, recent acquisition at the trade deadline, Ichiro Suzuki hitting that two-run home in the one game. And the savior, Raul, Raul Labanez. <laughs> those have seems to be the only two guys stepping up. But, Mark, what do you think about the Yankees being down 0-2 to, to Detroit, facing Verlander? Do they have any shot to come back without Jeter? Well, uh, first I'd like to comment on Derek Jeter. Um, I find that his loss is going to be very detrimental to the team. Um, they need that, um, that infield captain uh, that they're missing right now with their struggling hitters. Um, they, they, benched, they recently benched Nick Swisher and Alex Rodriguez for their poor hitting performance, and the loss of Derek Jeter just hurts them even more. Um, also, uh, going back to the D Detroit comment, um, the, the Tigers, this, they're taking it back to Detroit. Um, yeah. They lost two at home, and now they're playing arguably the best pitcher in baseball. It's, it's going to be rough for them. Definitely going to be rough for them, and Justin Verlander, 
reigning Cy Young and MVP winner, I believe. You won MVP last year, I believe. I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Again, I hated that decision, but that was way long ago. I can't argue about that anymore. Again, going up against Verlander, I think the Yankees are all but doomed. And you're right. The Ichiro and Raul Banez are the only ones that are swinging the bat right now. I thought with the way this, the season ended with Robbie Cano hitting that, getting that four four game, the four hits a game that last that last game that they played mm -hmm. to really clinch the AL East. I thought that he would bring that bat into the playoffs, and he's he's batting .63, I believe. He's up there with A. Rod and Curtis Granderson, the people that you expect to come through in the clutch, but. Uh, it has been remained to be seen. Mark, Definitely. Yeah. Anything else to say about the Yankees? Um, I, I think their age is also hurting them. Um, a lot of their, their star players that they signed for these 10-year contracts are starting to wear off. Uh, they're all getting old. They're going to have to start looking to youth in the future. Start looking to youth, potentially redrafting, potentially rebuilding. And we've seen if you do re the rebuilding process the correct way, that takes about four to five years. Absolutely. And if you do it wrong... You're looking at a Pittsburgh Pirates dilemma where you're not winning for 20. I promise and you, Tim, the Yankees, the Yankees have been are the there. <laughs> they, will, they will recover. Whether or not this season ends the way we want, they want it to, I think, that, I think that they'll be fine rebuilding and transitioning into a different team. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how Raul Abanias keeps this up. I mean, coming from, I mean, I'm very biased very little of the time, I believe so, but when Raul Abanias was in Philadelphia, it really didn't do much. Goes to the Yankees, he hits two home runs, <laughs> saves their postseason, and I'm ripping out my hair saying, Raul, how come, how come you didn't do this in Philadelphia? Jason Worth, too, with the Nationals with that game-winning home run. So it's pinstripes. Yeah, I, I guess. But anyway, moving along, Cardinals, we're going to shift it to the other National League championship series, the other, or the other championship series going on in the National League. Cardinals are now tied with the Giants 1-1, coming off their most recent game. Uh, we saw it with the Cardinals and the Nationals that you can never count the Cardinals out, scoring four runs in the ninth off Drew Storen. Absolute incredible feat. I want to ask you two guys, who do you think wins this series and in how many games? I think this is, this is one of the most intriguing battles for the NLCS. You have the Cardinals, who obviously have been there already. And, I mean, they lost a big part with Albert Pujols, but the Giants have been there, what, three years ago, three removed from the, the World Series? 2010. Something like that. Yeah. Right? About two years. So this is this is definitely an intriguing battle because they know what they're fighting for, and there's not a lot of inexperience there. I think if I had to pick one, I'd go with the Giants just because I like the way that they're pitching. And Tim Lincecum, I, I don't think you can ever count him out. I know that he's not been the same for a while, but I feel like the, the atmosphere that the playoffs bring, I think that he can get it going and start working that, and I think the Giants will overcome. I agree. Um, I'm going to take... The Giants in six games. Um, I like their, their next two matchups. They have Matt Cain and Tim Lincecum pitching. Um, both their, their aces, and they tied it up 1-1. They're, um, they're coming off that impressive comeback against the Cincinnati Reds the last series, and I like what they're doing there. Um, I don't think the Cardinals have the depth of their pitching staff to get them all the way through the series. Tim, you, you mentioned the... the the record for this for this NL, NLCS. Yeah, I think that it's going to be the Giants four two. Giants win the series win four, four to two. So yeah. in six games. Six games. In six games, I got the Cardinals winning this one in seven. You can never count them out. You can score twenty runs against them. You're right. They, and they'll find a way to come back. It's absolutely incredible. Something I've never seen out of any team in it's, my whole life. They've been fun to watch this postseason. That's fun to sure. watch and. Stressful to watch, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're a Washington Nationals fan. Uh, again, I know we're kind of looking ahead here, going into the postseason for some teams. We've seen uh, the Red Sox fire their manager, Bobby Valentine. Yeah. Bobby, how, could forget, how could I forget Bobby V? <laughs> but they fire him. The Rockies fire Jim Tracy. Those two candidates, those, those are the only two jobs open right now. Guys, who do you think fills these vacant spots for those two teams? I never saw the Bobby Valentine in Boston. Well, I mean, after the, before the season, obviously. I, think, I thought that Bobby V was going to come in there and really have a successful career with the, with the Boston Red Sox. After, after Francona leaving, he pretty much gave him a, a playoff team with Crawford and all those people. But the way that that came down, I can see 
I can see DeMarco Howe. He is, he's been with the organization for a while, so I can see him filling in with the Boston Red Sox. They, he's liked around that ball club. The players like him, the front office. And if I had to choose one for the Colorado Rockies, I would go Tom Runnels. He's Again, he's a... He's been there. He knows. He knows what he's doing, and they, they seem pretty excited about that pick, about that interview. Huh. Very interesting. Um, for the Red Sox, I have uh, Tony Pena, uh, the Yankees bench coach. Um, he's been in serious talks with them. He's their top candidate as of now. And uh, my surprise pick would be Brad Ausmus, a uh, longtime Houston Astro. Astro. Uh, for the Rockies, there's uh, increasing rumors that Jason Giambi will be uh, the candidate that. Uh, that would be grabs the job there. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, Jason. Also, um, I was going to say, uh, Ozzie Guillen has an interesting situation in Miami where he might not yeah. be. Yeah, I didn't think about Ozzie. I find it kind of funny. I think John Farrell ended up taking the job with Boston. Knows the AL East pretty well. He was the head coach of the, of the Blue Jays last year. Again, brought them back. Did a pretty good job. And, my, and Colorado is a little interesting. A little, yeah, little interesting. Mm -hmm. I think Sandy Alomar Jr. Mm, gets the job. He's been rumored too, along with uh, about five other people. But again, it's, I, I love talking off-season news. I love talking rumors, but I have to save that for another time. Does it for this segment? Up next, we're going to take a look into the w wide world of college sports. Stay tuned. more about IUPTV, we have the solution. IUPTV is now online on Facebook. You can find us by simply searching Facebook for IUPTV. Once you click like, you can check out your favorite shows on our IUPTV showcase, view our broadcast schedule, get updates on everything about your favorite station, and tell us how much you love your favorite shows. IUPTV, not like other stations. I'm a big believer in the power of we. We got each other, and that's a lie. We can tackle the tough challenges we face and build community through service and volunteering. We gotta hold on to what we got. It's time for you to raise your hand. Go to serve.gov and get involved in something you believe in. How will you raise your hand when they call your name? Are you with me? We weren't born. And welcome in to the Big Hit. Welcome back to the Big Hit is what I should say. And joining me now on the ad, Mike Gosnell, the goose, and in the middle, always dressed sharply, Tom Nobles. He's a sharp-dressed man. I'm going to quote some ZZ Top there. And guys, I know you two are the bigger hockey fans around here. I know we're going to do college football here, but I'm going to touch on NHL real quick. Rumored end to the lockout. I believe they're going to, uh, owners players are going to split the profits 50-50. Games could resume as of... July or August, I believe. I'm not 100% sure when. Goose, um, what have you? Just real quick. Well, the, what, the way the current CBA offer is, uh, they're going to condense the season down to 82 games. They're trying to get an 82-game season in uh, starting November 2nd. And like you said, Tim, it's going to be a 50-50 deal here. And the players, the biggest question that players have is how much money are, am I going to lose in the first year? Now, the NHL owners do not have a current plan to roll back salaries uh, this year, but um, it, they want to reduce the 57% uh, of the players would get to 50, and I think that's a bit even, uh, but I'm, in, in my gut, I don't think the players will accept this deal. Yeah. Tom, just real quick, what do you think about it? Uh, they should do it. Should, they should do it. Let's, let's get let's hockey back it. on the television. Let's get Simple as that. Hockey back, more on hockey to come next week, I personally guarantee what's, it. What's 7% of money you're not making? I don't know. Zero, I think. <laughs> yeah. More hockey to come next week, I personally guarantee it. Guys, let's move on to what we're really going to talk about here in the segment. That is college football. And I'm going to, well, I want to kick things off with West Virginia getting demolished. And I mean demolished in a big way. They got demolished by Texas Tech 
49-14. West Virginia falls out of the top 10 to number 13 and taking, them, taking their defense with them. Goose, I'm going to start it down with you. Is their season all but over? Quite simply. Is uh, their season over? Tim, uh, demolished would not be the right word. Obliterated, embarrassed, uh, blown out. Uh, you could, a number of adjectives you could use to describe that loss. Uh, Mountaineers just dominated. Uh, Geno Smith didn't even eclipse 300 yards passing. Uh, it just proves that the Big 12 is not a defensive-oriented league. Uh, case in point, uh, this game and the Texas-Oklahoma game. But uh, Seth Dagues, I think, is one of the more underrated quarterbacks for Texas Tech, one of the more underrated quarterbacks in the nation. He had 499 yards passing, and yes, their national title hopes are all but over. Uh, they need a miracle. They need an Alabama loss, a Notre Dame loss, a Kansas State loss. They have that opportunity coming up, but um, they need miracles. They need a wing and a prayer to make it back to the title picture. Definitely need a lot, and Geno Smith didn't have his normal game. Defense lets him down, as they always do. I think the defense averaged 45 points giving up a game. But, Tom, what do you take out of this West Virginia game? Is there, do you think their season is all but I over? I mean, they're, they're, their national title hopes are certainly done. Uh, but, I mean, they can still have a chance to play for a big BCS game. They, have, uh, they still have K-State, TCU, and Oklahoma all at home. Plus, they have Iowa State on the road, which just creeped into the top 25 now. So they have a few other teams to go against to kind of boost their ratings a little bit. And also, they still have Geno Smith. He didn't have the greatest game last week. But I mean, he, earlier this season, I mean, he was on he was on fire. He was the talk of the talk of the nation. So I mean, they still have an elite quarterback, and to move this team forward, so they can still get a BCS berth. To, but as far as the national championship goes, they're probably they're probably done. Yeah, I can agree with that. They could probably get a pretty nice bowl game out of it. Maybe a little more popularity for West Virginia, get them into that kind of game. And they could still win the Big Twelve. I mean, they could still win. Yeah, very well. They could still win the Big Twelve, but. Like we brought up on radio, I don't know if they're the team to beat. And I want to bring up their next game against Kansas State, currently number four and currently undefeated. Quite a surprise when the BCS rankings came out to see Kansas State at number four. Uh, preview that game for me, guys, against West Virginia and Kansas State. Give me some key factors to the game and, and ultimately who wins this game. I think for West Virginia, I think their, their key, their, their only factor, I think their only way to win is that they stop the battering ram that is Colin Klein. Colin Klein is the, the cog that runs the Kansas State Wildcat offense. Uh, 510 yards and 10 touchdowns this season rushing. Uh, quite simply for West Virginia, it's stop Colin Klein or else you're going to lose. And for Kansas State, I think just continue what you're doing. Um, there's, uh, there's no way that, you're gonna, that West Virginia could stop Colin Klein through the air. I mean, he's a run, this is a run-first team. He goes through Colin Klein. He's like the Tim Tebow. He's Tim Tebow-esque when he was in Florida. But uh, for West Virginia, I mean, if you stop Colin Klein, then you might win this game. Yeah, not to mention John Hubert as well, too. But uh, to build Can't off of, about him. Yeah, to build off uh, of what you said, though, with Colin Klein, uh, he's had 100, 100 rushing yards in each of his last two games, uh, including five touchdown, uh, five touchdown runs. And, but the thing to stat to look at, though, is he has no touchdown passes on the road this season, and also his yards per carry is a point and a half higher at home. And for WVU, they're, I mean, they, they, they played Texas Tech and Texas on – on the road, so these uh, the the home numbers are a little inflated for them, but they average 441 yards for the for the game on the air, and also 21 touchdowns through the air as well too. So, but Texas Tech is a similar similar style defense to Kansas State. So, they, what Texas Tech did really well was pressure pressure the, the receivers, get uh, uh, disrupt this uh, Geno Smith's timing a little bit, and that's why he had a, a little bit of an off game. And that's what I've been saying quite a while too. Is if your other defense is going up against West Virginia. Jam the receivers at the line, disrupt the timing, and you get the kind of game that West Virginia did against Texas Tech, and, and quite I, frankly, it wasn't. And them. I think that's the one facet of Kansas State's team that doesn't get talked about very much is the defense. I mean, like Tom brought up, Texas Tech's defense is a lot like Kansas State's, a yeah, lot like Kansas State's. Definitely a lot like Kansas State. And guys, I want to go to another game here. So, well, I want to talk about South Carolina for for a bit. They lose to LSU. I believe they fall to number seven in the rankings. Uh, they yeah, they now fall to seven. And now they take on questionable number two, Florida Gators. Now, I want you guys to preview that game. And could South Carolina, numerically it would be an upset, but would you call it an upset if South Carolina wins? And do you think South Carolina will win? Well, first of all, I don't think Florida – Florida's an undeserving number two. They haven't 
they, they, they beat LSU, give that to them. But they have a tough slate of games coming up, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee even. Or they already played Tennessee, they already did beat them. But uh, uh, the, the Gamecocks who don't, who trail this series 6-23 and 3, have not, have not yet won three, had a three-game winning streak over the Gators. But this, this team, I think, could do it. I think the Gamecocks can beat Florida. I think they will beat Florida. If Marcus Lattimore and Jadavion Clowney both have great games. Uh, last game, they really didn't play that well. I mean, Marcus Lattimore was held uh, 35 rushing yards. That's not, like, <clears throat> excuse me, that's not like him. And I think the Gamecocks do win this game. Yeah, I mean, it, the LSU put the blueprint out there for them. You stop Lattimore, you stop Shaw, you're going to stop South Carolina. And the lat, but this, it would, what Florida's going to have to do going forward is they're going to have to stop Lattimore. Last time he had 212 yards and three touchdowns in the swamp. And they have to, what LSU did really well is they, they limited this, the zone read that, that South Carolina runs so well. And if you limit the zone read, you limit their play action, which gives them the big plays down the field. But for, for South Carolina, they're going to have to stop the Florida ground game, which is averaging 233 yards a game now as well, too. So I, an interesting stat that I, that I saw was the fourth quarter. South Carolina at this point has given up 27 points total in the fourth quarter, and Florida's given up 23 points with one less game played. So if this game comes down to the fourth quarter, the, it's going to be interesting to see with both teams not giving up a lot of points. It's going to be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. So I think both teams are pretty matched defensively. I think it's going to come down to South Carolina and their ability to throw the ball, mm -hmm. something Florida, quite frankly, doesn't have. They've got a great quarterback, but the throwing game and the air game just isn't on the same level I mean, as South let's Carolina. Be, let's be honest here. Steve Spurrier runs his offense through Marcus Lattimore. But True. Connor Shaw has to be another piece that, he, that has to get going. You cannot just run the ball through Marcus Lattimore. You cannot run your offense through one person. Yeah, you have definitely. to have good, a good supporting cast in order to win games, and – Suffice it to say, they didn't have a good supporting cast. They didn't, their supporting cast didn't show up last game. No, that's so that their offense is, is built off of that zone read and, and getting the big plays off of play action. And what LSU did so well, like I said, was just limit that, limit that zone read and, and fill those gaps. Yeah, definitely. And uh, guys, I want to preview one more game before we call this segment a wrap. Um, I'm going to preview Oregon and Arizona State. You may be wondering why I have that on there. Oregon currently number three. But I believe in what a lot of other people believe, Oregon should be number two. I want you guys to preview this game for me real quick, and what do you expect from Oregon out of this game? Well, an interesting stat that I, that I found on ESPN, that Oregon has outscored Arizona State 175 to 81 during the past four games that they've played Deuce with the numbers. in Tempe. Uh, I want to give Arizona State the benefit of the doubt and say they're going to make a game of this. I don't think this is going to be much of a contest. I think um, Marcus Mariota and Kenyon Varner will dominate this game. I mean, they just oh, Arizona State just missed Kraft in the top 25, but Oregon, I think, just too dynamic of an offense. Their defense has improved. Uh, they are the rightful number two team in, this co in the country. Um, it, it's just... It's Oregon versus Arizona State. I mean, who are you going to choose? I mean, it's like apples and oranges. Yeah, I mean, if, if Arizona, unfortunately, if Arizona State wouldn't have lost to that game against Missouri, we'd be having to talk about a much bigger matchup right now. Uh, they would definitely be in the top 25, possibly even further up. But the, the thing with a, uh, Arizona State is they're, they're fifth in the nation in pass defense. So, that, unfortunately, though, against Oregon, that's – you want to be in a fifth in the nation in runs defense, not pass defense. That plays into Oregon strengths, being th averaging 302 yards uh, a game on the ground. And it was something that was interesting, though, that I found also, too, is uh, Arizona State at home, the last three times they played top 25 teams at home, they've beaten them. So that could, I don't know how much is going to play into it, but I thought that was an interesting stat as well, too. And, but Oregon, they're, they're probably going to feel a little bit slighted in, in the rankings, have that chip on their shoulder that they always seem to have. So they're probably that doesn't bode well for Arizona State. Definitely because that Oregon has got something to play for. They're playing for number two in the country, which quite frankly they should have. And well, guys, they have a backloaded schedule too. They so do also helps. have a backloaded schedule, so something to keep an eye out for. We'll update you here on the big hit of standings and potential matchups as the season goes along. But right now, it's going to do it for this segment. Up next, after the break, we're going to continue our trip around the world, the wide world of college sports. So keep it locked into the big hit on IEP TV. Personal foul? Inactive activities on a glorious day. Huh? Let's get out there and play! Sweet. Ooh, freeze! When do I get to be in? 
Uh-oh. Hey, Reggie, frozen people can't talk. P-L-A-Y! <laughs> An hour a day. I'm it. There are lots of great play ideas online, but don't stay too long. See you, play it. Welcome back to the Big Hit, and we're going to continue our trip around the wide world of college sports, taking a look into college basketball. And joining me now on the far end, joining us for at least one more show, Anthony Shear, and in the middle, Josh Jones. Guys, I know we previewed NBA last week. This week we're going to do college basketball. It's that time for basketball season kicking off. It's going to be a great fun time. Anthony, I'm going to start down with you here. Uh, give me the most intriguing team going into the season. Like, who could be an underdog or a team that could surprise everybody through this entire college basketball season? I actually like UNLV. I mean, they have two returning starters. Anthony Marshall has 12, rebound, 12 points, five rebounds, four assists a game. And he also has Mike Moss, who averages a double-double double, and 14 points and 10 rebounds a game. So you have those two guys returning, I think, with an easy Mountain West conference that they're going to play in. I actually like them going into the tournament maybe as a three or a four seat where they could actually contend for a national championship. You, so you're, you got UNLV? Yes. UNLV. Uh, Don't really hear that team a lot. Josh Jones, run, yeah. what are you thinking here, man? They got the running Rebels. Well, I got NC State talking about the Wolfpack out of the ACC. They have four out of five returning starters. They have, in which they all average double-figure points. So they're well-balanced offense. They have... a if they, have, they had a lot of close games last year. If they would have pulled them out, they probably would have had even higher seed in the tournament, which they, which they actually got to the Sweet 16, lost to Kansas by three. Would Could have been a different story in this double-A title game. But I say NC State. I think they're going far this year. Do you and, think they play in a tough conference? I mean, you got North Carolina, you have Duke, you have oh yeah. yeah, a couple other tough teams in that conference. I mean, It's a tough conference, but I still think they can pull it out. Okay. Not, not number one, but they'll be in the top five, okay. guaranteed. So you're just going to say NC State's going to be able to hang around for most of the year, and then when time comes for March Madness, they're going to step on the game. Oh, yeah. Definitely? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Returning four out of five. NC State and UNLV, they do well this year. You can thank these two guys right up here for telling you ahead of time. Yeah. Guys, uh, now I want to go and ask you about your top five teams. Rank of one through five. Let's go number five to number one. Whoever wants to start it off, go for it. I guess I'll start it off here. I mean, obviously, you look at it, I like Louisville at number five. Then after that, you go with Kentucky, number three, Duke, number two, UCLA, and number one, Indiana. Louisville has a lot of returning stars. Payton Silva's coming back. The Big East has kind of fallen off a lot this year to me. And then you look at Kentucky. It's always going to be Kentucky. Kentucky's a good team. They're always going to get young talent in there. You know, you throw UCLA has maybe the best freshman in the country in Shabazz Muhammad. Great name, by the way. I love that name. Shabazz <laughs> Muhammad. Shabazz. And then you look at Duke. Duke, experience. Steph Curry's coming back. Seth Curry, I'm sorry. Seth. Seth Curry's coming back. You have Mason Plumlee coming back. And then also, I have Indiana as my number one. They have the best player in the country in Cody Zeller. And we'll, talk, we'll touch on that later. But I think when you have the best player in the country and five returning starters on that team, I think they're going to be the number one team in the country. All right, Josh, I know you were making a, uh, you were a little surprised at that. Give me your top five first, five, uh, top five teams first. And then if you guys want to go and argue at each other's top fives, feel free to go ahead because I know, Josh, you had a look on your face like you completely disagree with that. Oh, but no, no, no. It's similar for the most part. One team that surprised me, but I'll lay out my top five. I have Syracuse at number five, Duke at number four, Louisville at number three, Indiana number two, and Kentucky number one. The Syracuse, they have eight, eight – not returning the starters, but they have eight fre not freshmen, juniors and up. So they're a veteran team. They went 34-3 and three last year, deep in the tournament. I think they can do it again. Then in Duke, as you said, Seth Curry, he's returning. He, and with Austin Rivers, he'll get more playing time. Also, same with uh, Thornton and two Plumlee brothers. They're big on inside. They can go far as well. Then Louisville, the size, the quickness of Silva. And they have Dang, who averaged – 
almost three blocks a game last year. So they're big, big presence. They, then I have Indiana, as you said, all five starters. Coley Zeller, one of the best in the country. And Kentucky is, it's just Coach Calipari. Yeah. And they always get the best recruits in the country, just hands down. But the UCLA surprises me. I think, I mean, you have the best player and best recruit in the country in Shabazz Muhammad coming to your team. It's a young team. They have guys returning from their, on their roster. I mean, Muhammad's going to miss time because he got improper benefits, so he'll probably miss yeah. some games. But to me, overall, you're talking about a UCLA team that needs to win because Ben Howell needs that contract extension. It's kind of like a make-or-break year for that team. They need to get to the tournament and maybe even make a Final Four. They need to. I'm, the one thing that may go for you in that way is the Pac-12 is become one of the weaker conference. I don't even consider them a power conference anymore. Nah, you get you usually have one team coming out in the last couple of years. Yeah, they they fell off. But that's a, that's a tough one. He, if there's one team, it might be UCLA. I just like I I think Shabazz Muhammad. He'll probably come out in the NBA draft after this year. He's going to be a top five pick. He's big. He's tall. He can shoot. Maybe the top yeah. player in the country. He is definitely in my top five players in the country, too. I, I mean, I know you touched on it. It's a fun name to say Shabazz Muhammad. So I, I mean, every Sh time he dunks, we can just yell Shabazz and, like, go absolutely crazy. I don't know. Maybe that's just a weird thing I do. That is a weird uh, thing that you do. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Well, okay, well, let's admit that on there as we're recording. I was thinking maybe Shabang because, like, dunk. Like, yeah. Shabang. Yeah. Explain that's better. Well, we'll come up with catchy terms later, I guess. Uh, not for now while we're doing previews. Guys, uh, I want to ask you about your top five players. You Sheer, you're probably going to have Shabazz Muhammad up there, but let's start with Josh Jones first. Who are your top five players, rank them number five to number one, and why you have them ranked the way you do? Okay. Well, number five, I have Noel, the recruit out of going to Kentucky. I have him at number five because he may be like the top recruit in the country, but he's a freshman, so he still has to prove himself. And Anthony Davis, big shoes to fill. To fill. Only thing he's missing is a unibrow, of course. Then you have, I have number four, I have Doug McDermott out of Creighton. He averaged about 23 and eight rebounds a game, and he is that team. Without Doug, McDerm the Doug McDermott, that team doesn't even get 20 wins. So he is the heart and soul of that team. He's up there. Then at number three, I have Trey Burke out of Michigan. He averaged fi about 15 points a game, five assists as a freshman. He leads that team. He is the floor general. He can only get better with time. And that at Hardaway as his wingman, this team is something to watch out for. Then number two, I have Cody Zeller. He's athletic, big, runs the floor, can take outside or inside, very talented, like his older brother. And for his experience, five starters, he is the center of that team. Then number one, maybe a little surprise, I have Isaiah Ken out of Murray State. He is, he led the running Rebels, went 31 and two last year. He led him in scoring, averaging about 20 points a game. But I think he could have a breakout year, kind of like Jimmer Fredette did when he just came out of nowhere. I think Isaiah Cannon is capable of that kind of game. I would say my top five, I mean, all these players are really great, but obviously you have to put Noel from Kentucky in there. I agree with you on that. I think he's a great recruit. And actually, at number five, Isaiah Cannon from, Murray's, from Murray State. I think he's the best point guard in the country. To me, he's number one. Then I have Nelson Noel, the kid from Kentucky. I think he's going to... He's not going to be able to fill Anthony Davis' shoes, but he's going to be able to step in right away. Number three, I have Doug McDermott from Creighton. Great player, but they're only a one-man team. We saw that in the tournament. They can't go very far when they just have Doug McDermott. Number two, I have my boy Shabazz Muhammad from UCLA. You just want to say that name as well. Yes, because I love Shabazz. <laughs> it's a great name. Why does no one just get on my board with this? No, it's, it's a great, it's great and name. number one, I have Cody Zeller. I mean, the guy does everything. He could be this year's version of Anthony Davis. He won't come out because he says he wants to graduate, but he can score, he can defend. He's the reason Indiana is back to where it's at right now in the country. I mean, they're, they were a cellar dweller like three years ago. Zeller right. comes along, and they're a great team now. Yeah. That's my top five. I think the only t person I have a question mark on is Doug McDermott. Great player. He can score from anywhere on the court, but if he can't defend. And that's a big problem for, for Creighton. It's like oh, yeah. he can't play any defense. He's not going to get drafted very high in the NBA. And that's a concern for me. It's, you're a great college player, but where does it progress after that? Kind of like what, how Jimmer is yeah. like non-existent NBA. Yeah. And how J.J. Reddy for the first few years was like that. Yeah, I mean, McDermott stayed locally. I mean, he had a chance to go somewhere else. I mean, his dad coaches at Creighton, so he decided to go play for his dad. He could have went to a big school like North Carolina and been like a backup guy, but he decided to stay home, be the guy, and I think that kind of benefits him a little bit. But Definitely. I just have concerns about creating that team. If somebody else can step up and be a good number two, 
they could be a dangerous team in a tournament, but I don't know if they can have somebody like that. Oh, man. I, I think you just wanted to say Shabazz. I was surprised you didn't say Shabazz. I just Shabazz say it again. Huh? Can I say it again? Yeah, if you want to say it, look right <laughs> into the camera and say Shabazz Muhammad. Shabazz Muhammad. What there a great you, name. Are you going to name your kid that one day? I'm going to nickname him Shabazz because that's a great name. Uh, you better play basketball is what I have to say. <laughs> real quick, I want to I wanna ask you guys just one real quick question. Give me one, one, one name answer. Number six player. Like we did top five. Give me one more player that you wanted to put in the top five but didn't. I'll you go. Mm -hmm. All right. I, how I said Trey Burke, but I didn't say his opposite, Hardaway. He's, he's a shooter, kind of like his father, so he's getting up there. And he was always a scorer. So I think if he plays a long, uh, plays within the system in a long well, he can be at, in the top ten. Maybe Naismith, Naismith watch. Maybe. Maybe. Right, sure. I actually go with Trey Burke as my sixth uh. guy. I mean, I, he was close. He was in my top five, but I had to – I had to hit my boy Shabazz in there. That's why I just had you to had take. You had to put Shabazz in there yeah. so you drop out that one person. That's yeah. why I wanted to ask the question to see who Shabazz really took. But, again, guys, i got to close up this segment. I know, Sheer, you just want to keep saying Shabazz Muhammad, Shabazz Muhammad, but <laughs> i got to cut you off, buddy. Oh, man. So, sorry. <laughs> up next, after the break, we're, gonna clo we're going to close out the show with the segment I love to call Rapid Fire. So keep it locked into the big hit. Today I'm going to talk about Patty. Patty's best characteristics, she's stupid. Stupid and ugly. Everything she does is ugly. Watch her eat. Watch her stuff her face. Look at her. Greasy hair, dirty fingernails. It makes me want to vomit. Get a life, Patty. Thank you. Want to learn more about IUPTV? We have the solution. IUPTV is now online on Facebook. You can find us by simply searching Facebook for IUPTV. Once you click like, you can check out your favorite shows on our IUPTV showcase, view our broadcast schedule, get updates on everything about your favorite station, and tell us how much you love your favorite shows. IUPTV, not like other stations. back to the final segment of the big hit we like to call this segment rapid fire as you saw by the awesome bumper you saw before the, the fade to us I'm trying to get a little technical here joining me now on the end mike milliner and in the middle Bree spitzer we're going to try to talk a little more this rapid fire segment normally we like i like to pound things out you know question one question two question three we're going to slow things down a little bit we got a little time to fill Got uh, some questions to add that I wouldn't normally ask on any other segment. So let's dive in and have some fun with this. Mike, we're going to start down there with you. We're going to start with a little NASCAR, something we don't do a lot around here. Jimmy Johnson, five-time champion in a row, Jimmy Johnson. He's currently seven points behind the current points leader, Brad Kozlowski, and 23 points behind them sitting in third is Danny Hamlin. Now, Mike, I'm going to ask you, do you think Jimmy Johnson can make the comeback here? Could Danny Hamlin potentially make a run? Or do you think Kozlowski holds off the entire pack and wins his very first Sprint Cup championship? With Jimmy Johnson only seven points back and uh, Danny Hamlin sitting in third with 23 points behind, I think uh, Jimmy Johnson is going to come back and, uh, and win it. He, he knows how to win. He, um, he can... He was 17, or he was uh, 14 points down, but he uh, brought it down to seven. So if he uh, gets in a couple races and um, does good, he could make that seven come like two points down. Yeah, De Jimmy's definitely got the experience to be there. Jeff Jimmy's definitely got what it takes to overtake the number two Miller Lite Dodge of Brad Keselowski. I know I'm diving in a little too far deep, but Bree, do you think Jimmy can make a comeback here, or what, what do you see happening? at the end of the series. I definitely think he has the chance to make a comeback. He knows how to win any, he, he won five consecutive sprint titles. So, I mean, he knows how to do it and he has the equipment behind it. But I feel like it's fair game for anybody with the 23 point difference between the top three competitors, it's fair game for anybody and there should be no one holding back from anything. But the only thing I am nervous about Jimmy Johnson's situation is Chad Knauss, the crew chief, just recently was suspended for uh, 
of fa or, uh, failed post inspections after the race. So that might be a little difficult for them, the race crew, but I mean, it's happened before. He's had a couple offenses. So I'm sure Jimmy Johnson can definitely fight through this one. He has a positive attitude through all the interviews. So I think he definitely can. Yeah, definitely losing Chad Canals is a major disappointment for mm -hmm. Jimmy Johnson. But again, he's proven that with the powerful Hendrick engines that they've given him the entire season, along with Jeff Gordon, Dale and Hart Jr. And uh, yeah. I can't think of the third driver. I completely baffled. I should know this. Tony Stewart. No, Tony Stewart owns his own team. It's oh, right. you, oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they supply <laughs> that. It also counts as a Hendrick motor because Hendrick also supplies Stewart Haas Racing with all their engines. So... Little NASCAR info for, for, for all you out there watching. Uh, I do think Kozlowski holds off the championship. It's his year. He's had a great year so far. I just think he continues to uh, ride out that streak. Uh, I'm going to switch it up here from the world of going in circles in NASCAR to being several hundred thousand feet above the earth and into space. That's right. We're going out of this world <laughs> with the Red Bull Stratus jump. What did, I mean, I just saw a couple of clips of that, and I'm looking at the view. Did you the watch guy, it live? I, I did, oh unfortunately, not watch it live. I, I had to catch the highlights on CNN. First yeah. one I seen it was delayed because of the wind. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. What do you guys think of that jump? I mean, is it a jump? Is it a glide? Or is it a, it's a, pretty much a free fall from space. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. He's the basically crazy. Yeah. <laughs> the first man to ever break the uh, sound, sound the sound. Yeah, Mach 1. Yeah, Mach 1. It, talk about that for a little bit. What do you two think about that? I am just absolutely amazed with him. I I would never be able to do something like that. A bunch of my friends always talk about going skydiving. Mm -hmm. oh my God, I'm so scared. I mean, he hesitated a little bit jumping, but who wouldn't? You're on the yeah. edge of the atmosphere. That's crazy. Yep. He broke three records. It's the highest uh, highest distance a balloon traveled carrying a human, the highest or the fastest free fall speed, and the highest jump. So he's breaking records left and right. But I mean, uh, Felix Baumgarter has a a long, long history of doing crazy stunts. He actually, earlier, uh, he flew across the English Channel with a carbon wing. So he's definitely not your average person, but oh, I definitely idolize him. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with everything uh, we had to say. Um, it's crazy how he could, he was that high and he just jumped. And 24 I'd, miles. That's it's, ridiculous. It's ridiculous, yeah. It, there was somebody who uh, actually did it uh, 53 years ago. His name was... Uh, Joseph Kinninger, he was the head person uh, talking to um, Felix. Um, he was the head person of the jump and everything, but he actually did it 53 years ago. It wasn't as high, but he did a space jump also. Yeah, definitely. That's it was really cool. It was really cool, really fun to watch. And you could see, I guess they were saying when he was out in space, I think he fell. For I think it was the first two minutes of the jump, he was literally in space. He, I mean, he could have waved his arms, he could have kicked his legs. He still would not have moved because there were no air molecules for him to bounce himself off of. If you watch the tape, I think about a minute and a half, two minutes in, he actually hits the atmosphere, and he starts to uncontrollably spin. Uh -huh. That is when, I guess they said, he hit the actual, uh, he hit the Earth's atmosphere, uh -huh. and when he was actually able to hit air, and that's what caused him to spin out like that. He caught control of himself, just pretty much went straight line down, finished, I think, 40-some miles outside of his original target zone, yeah. but... Landed on both Thank feet. Thank God he's deploy. alive. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> hey, it must have been a great ride. I wish they would have had a camera on his helmet. Oh, they actually did. I was just um, looking on it. They have a view from, like, underneath. So you could, like, see his, like, head, like, his view going down. It's crazy. Yeah, I just fun. watched it. I'm so interested. They, they actually had to do the jump twice because the first one, it got delayed. Mm -hmm. um, with, they had a wind, and they couldn't send him up in the balloon. He so. also had problems with his visor defrosting, yeah. so he couldn't see for a little bit. Yeah, it's I mean, if something was going wrong for me, I would have just quit. Scary stuff. <laughs> You're falling like, from into space, and you can't see. Congratulations, <laughs> Felix, Felix Baumgartner. Hopefully, you get to do it again soon if you are. Do you think he will pull another stunt? Or, I mean, hey, he, he broke could. all the records, he said, so he maybe I'll take a little break. <laughs> from what I watched and what I read online, he said he wanted to um, be the, if it ever happens again, he wants to take the spot that um, Joseph uh, Kinninger took. Um, he wants to be the head person of the jump mm -hmm. and talk to a person through it and I can control everything. Yeah, definitely. Now, from going from the edge of the Earth's atmosphere in space back onto the gridiron of football, <laughs> you gotta love my transitions here and my hand motions. But <laughs> so eccentric. I try to be. I'm <laughs> uh, gonna switch things down to Oregon State, currently number eight in the BCS, currently undefeated. I want you two to talk about Oregon State. 
Uh, give me some offensive things they've done, defensive things they've done, and you think they can make a run at a title game in the later part of the year? I don't got much on uh, Oregon State, but uh, I think they are they are a pretty good team. But I mean, they haven't been this good for a while, so I think that's why they're an eighth. If they were this good in the past couple seasons, they would be higher in the rankings. But that's why I believe that they're uh, eighth. Okay, great. I feel like they definitely do have a, a shot at the BCS Bowl. I mean, this is the best start they've had since 1939, and uh, which is pretty impressive in itself. And the offense and defense have both been impressing me lately. The eight, uh, their offense is eighth in the country, and Marcus Wheaton and Brandon Cooks have a really good combo going, a receiving combo. But their defense is top rushing in the conference. They have fewer than 100 rushing yards against them, and they have the third down or top third down conversion defense as well along with a tied turnover margin at plus six. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, brought up my stats. But, yeah, they definitely have a lot working for them. The one thing I worry about them, though, is the schedule. They have a mm -hmm. tough schedule ahead of time. I mean, they had some crucial wins earlier, just uh, at their win at Wisconsin. Not at Wisconsin, home against Wisconsin. Yeah, that was a big win. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. But uh, also, they beat UCLA while they were ranked 19. So they're beating top teams as well, and it was away. So, I mean, they, they definitely have been putting things together. But... They definitely should be worried for Stanford, which is ranked 20. And then their arch rival, the Civil War, <laughs> Oregon, <laughs> at number three. So I feel they definitely have a chance for a bowl, but it'll be tough. Definitely going to be a tough ride for them. Hopefully they can pull it out, though. Oregon definitely going to be the Civil War. You can say that in a really cool voice. Civil Narrate War. Narrate it. And, uh, you know, you got a documentary there. A lot yeah, of hurdles to jump to make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a jump. It's going to be definitely a game to watch once the time gets here. I'm going to ask you guys one more thing, and I want to ask you who your athlete of the week is. Now, this could be anybody from any sport. could be any person you want it to be. And uh, Whoever wants to go first, who do you have as your athlete of the year? Or not the year, athlete of the week, <laughs> and why? The week, um, I have Ra Raul Ibanez, and... Uh, I feel like he is the one who's actually carrying this Yankees team. After everything that's happened with Derek Jeter's injury, he is the, the hitter that everyone's relying on. He was pinch hit for A-Rod. He has three home runs in this season, two of them uh, in the ninth inning to bring the Orioles into extra innings and stuff. And uh, he's been hitting bat batting averages of 438, and he's just tearing the cover off the ball. He's the oldest player in postseason history to hit a walk-off home run, and he may be the key to the Yankees' success. Mike, who do you got? I got, first thing that comes to my mind is Peyton Manning. Good Just hit. because, I mean, it, he was, the Broncos were down 24 nothing at halftime, and they bring back the second half, they bring uh, 35 unanswered points to win the game, and that just shows you that uh, Peyton Manning is, He's back to the old paint man he was when he played for Colts before he had his surgery and before he had his neck injury. And um, he's, I might even think he's better than he was. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. both good picks. If I got a pick, if it means anything, Felix Baumgartner jumped from the edge of the world. That was probably <laughs> the, cool, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. That view, plus what, everything he did, completely awesome. Mm -hmm. Just Absolutely fantastic. I'm Breaking so world records left, right, <laughs> up, and down. The video scares me every video time. The video scares me every time. <laughs> oh, that's going to do it for this episode of The Big Hit. Make sure you catch us every Wednesday through Friday here on the one and only IUP TV. Make sure you check out our brand new YouTube page too, IUP TV, The Big Hit. For director Jess Owak, producer Josh Carney, everybody behind the scenes, Mike Bree, I'm your host, Tim Quigley, and I'm saying I'm going to probably see you on YouTube later.